Well, welcome everyone. Um, my name is Bill Schneiderwin. I'm a professor in the New Eastern Languages and Cultures Department at UCLA and on the uh, steering committee for the Center for Jew Jewish Studies. I'm really delighted um, on behalf of the Alan D. Levy Center for Jewish Studies to welcome you all to today's event with Professor Mahri Leonard Fleckman, um, Mark of Contradictions, The Creation of Judah's History and the Case of Samson. Um, this event is part of the Bible in Ancient uh, World seminar series and is co-sponsored by the UCLA Department of Near Eastern Languages and Cultures and the UCLA Center for the Study of Religion. We would like to thank you for coming and we ask you to please silence your cell phones. I guess that means me. I didn't do it yet. Um, Professor Fleckman is an assistant professor of Hebrew Bible in Religious Studies in the Department of uh, at the College of Holy Cross in Worcester, Massachusetts. See, so I said Worcester. That means I know. Did it. Did that, that means I went to a, uh, school in Boston as well. Um, <laughs> she specializes in Iron Age history and the composition of the history of the Hebrew Bible. And, the, uh, and she's the author of The House of David, Between Political Formation and Literary Revision. I was going to bring my copy here to for a little show and tell. It's a really fantastic book, and one of the things that um, inspired us to uh, bring her here, uh, her current book project, provisionally titled Scribal, Represent Scribal Representations and Social Landscapes of Iron Age uh, Shvela, focus on, focuses on scribal representations of the other in ancient Israel in relation to broader questions of identity in uh, the Iron Age Levant. Um, and is under contract with Oxford University Press. Um, Mahri has published numerous scholarly and public-facing books and articles and is currently the Catholic Biblical Quarterly Book Review Editor, editor for uh, uh, Old Testament and Qumran, and is active on uh, numerous other editorial boards and professional committees. Um, I regard her as, as one of the sort of up-and-coming um, uh, young biblical scholars, and it's really a privilege for us to come and bring her here today at uh, Harvard at UCLA. Thank you. Thank you. Well, thanks, Phil. I really appreciate that very kind opening. Um, it's a real pleasure for me to be here today. Um, we put it off in March, and here I am finally, which is really great. I'd like to thank Bill and the Levy Center, is that the, the um, and all the co-sponsors for the invitation. So my talk for you today is on the biblical character Samson, or Shimshon, whose textual history begins sometime in the Iron Age and whose stories are preserved in the Sefer Shoftim, the Book of Judges. Historian Michel de Certeau once said that in biblical texts, the mark of contradictions, fragmentations, and adjunctions is preserved before this plurality can be transformed into a book or into a Bible. These marks of contradictions and fragmentations often manifest most clearly through biblical characters who lack stable identities and contain indeterminacies of meaning. Samson is a key example of such instability and indeterminacy. His stories frustrate expectations of a clean storyline or moral arc and instead read as disjointed, often paradoxical character sketches, even in what Robert Alter has called the architectonic tightness of the Samson cycle in the Book of Judges. He can seem a peripheral figure in the Bible by contemporary religious standards, at least, but his interpretive history suggests otherwise. Over time, Samson has functioned not so much as a character or an individual as a site, than as a site of memory, of scribal discourse, and ongoing invention. So in this talk, I'd like to suggest that Samson can be an axis around which to explore the development of biblical narrative and the ongoing creation of history and tradition, beginning with Judahite or Judean history. Through his making and remaking, Samson exemplifies that history and tradition are vibrant and living forces that remain open to interpretive possibility. So I'll begin with a modern image. This is the blinded Samson, painted by Levis Corinth in 1912. Corinth was a leader of German Impressionism, who lived from 1858 to 1925 in what was then Prussia. He was a handsome man, and he supposedly loved beautiful women and often used nude women as his subjects. He was also apparently a deeply reflective person, who had a habit of painting a self-portrait every year on his birthday as a means of self-examination. 
1911, the year before this image was painted, he suffered a stroke that left him partially paralyzed, and he emerged with a perpetual limp and a chronic tremor in his hands. He began to paint again a year later with the help of his wife, which is when the blinded Samson emerged. During this time, Corinth started to incorporate expressionist feelings in his work and to paint images of human suffering, including a tormented Job and a dying Jesus. But this portrait of Samson was unique because it was his self-portrait that year. In it, we can see Corinth's self-projection onto Samson. In the scene following Samson's blinding by his enemies and right before he commits mass suicide, I'm sorry, mass murder and suicide in Judges 16. The extent to which Corinth's brush was guided by his wife's hand is also unclear. Her name was Charlotte Berend, and she was also an artist whose work was often subordinated to her husband's, and she has her own fascinating history. She came from a Jewish merchant family, outlived Corinth by 42 years, and eventually resettled in the States. Corinth himself died from pneumonia in 1925, and his work was later condemned by the Nazis and put on display as degenerate art. Only recently were some of his paintings returned to the heirs of their original Jewish owners, many of whom had been patrons of Corinth's work. So this is just one image that draws us into Samson's long interpretive history. He has passed through many stages, beginning with his tales or vignettes in Judges 13 to 16, some of which, according to Susan Neidich, may be as old as Israel's origins and may themselves draw from a repertoire of older mythological legends. If so, the hazy prehistory of these stories is lost to us. We can only make educated guesses about their development. These tales include the following, as you can see on this slide. The tale of his divine conception in Judges 13, Samson and the lion, followed by Samson and the unnamed woman around Timnah in Judges 14 to 15. Uh, the men of Judah, or the Ish Yehuda, who appear later in Judges 15. A very brief mention of Samson and the prostitute, or the Isha Zona, a woman, a prostitute in Gaza. Samson and Delilah, which takes up the majority of Judges 16, and then his death at the end. Some of these stories may have circulated independently before they were drawn into what we call a Samson cycle and combined with other judges or savior figures in an early judges scroll. By placing his stories toward the end of the book of Judges, between the savior figures of chapters 3 to 12 and what we refer to as the appendices at the end, Samson becomes a way station and a bridge between the declining period of the judges and the rise of the early monarchy in Samuel. But he also resides somewhat awkwardly in his present location. The figures who precede him reside north and east of Judah, and they arise in moments of crisis to go to war against an oppressor leading a local group to victory. These figures are commonly thought to derive from northern traditions outside of Judah that are later recast as Judah's history. In contrast, Samson resides in a liminal southwest space between the coast and the central highlands. He leads no political group, and he is neither obviously Israelite nor Judahite. His role in the judge's narrative is an enigma, and scholars don't often know what to make of his textual history, but he takes up more space than any other judge's figure. And Cheryl Exum argues that there have been more interpretations of Samson than of any other biblical character. She writes that Samson can be anything from, quote, heroic fool, foolish hero, trickster, tragic wild man, comic bandit, tragic comic trickster, terrorist, foolish freedom fighter, type of Israel, fool for love, Nazarite judge, negative example, and hero of the faith. So what was the scribal fascination with Samson? and Why did his stories end up in the book of Judges? So for the remainder of this talk, I'd like to take a deep dive into the Samson stories to explore these questions. I'm going to walk us through these stories that I've just outlined on the slides, um, their internal contradiction, plaus like plausible processes of, de of development, and simultaneously I'll combine that with Samson's role in early Jewish history and reception history as he's slowly crafted into a Judahite or Judean hero and anti-hero. As we explore Samson in the Judges text and his interpretive history, we'll see how malleable he is as a character in Judges and in early Judaism and Christianity. The ongoing scribal interest in Samson is demonstrated in the first century CE, most prominently by the historian Josephus, through whom Samson becomes unambiguously Judean for the first time. 
and through New Testament writers who craft Samson into a hero of faith. Though a certain dis-ease with Samson develops in the rabbinic period, he was simultaneously viewed increasingly as a messianic figure in both Judaism and Christianity. Since then, interpretations of Samson have continued to proliferate in religious and non-religious contexts. So at the end of this talk, I'll kind of turn and offer some thoughts on Samson in relation to the development of biblical narrative and the so what question about why this matters for history more broadly. All right, so let's begin with Judges 13. The Samson narrative opens with this story of divine conception and birth. An angel appears to an unnamed woman, the wife of Manoah. She is the story's key figure, not her husband, who's characterized in the Talmud as an ignorant, boorish person. Like many biblical accounts of miraculous conceptions, an angel appears directly to the woman and tells her she's going to have a son. The child is to be an Azir Elohim, one consecrated to God, not of his own volition, as an adult, as the laws stipulate in number six, but from the moment of his conception. The woman's womb becomes the space of consecration, and she is the one who receives the dietary restrictions of those making Nazarite vows. She's not to consume wine, other intoxicants, or eat unclean food until maybe his birth or maybe after he's weaned, the the story number says. This chapter is the introduction through which we view the entire Samson narrative that follows. According to its opening verses, Samson will be a lifelong Nazarite and will begin to deliver Israel from the Philistines. This is also one of the most mystical texts in the Bible, containing a remarkable description of the Ish Elohim, the man or the angel of God, whom Samson's mother describes as most awesome, and who refuses Manoah's request for his name by saying, why do you ask my name? It is wondrous. Like the angel or man who struggles with Jacob, In Genesis 32, the divine messenger evades the human desire to name and categorize. Manoah wants to feed the angel, but angels don't eat. So the angel suggests that Manoah offer the meal to God. He does, and the angel ascends in the flame of the offering. Judges 13 is the theological driver of the Samson narrative and of many early religious interpretations of Samson. The name Samson or Shimshon links to Shemesh, son, and he acquired a mythological aura in rabbinic texts that described him as akin to God, who, like Samson, was a sun and shield, drawing from Psalm 84. According to Tractate Sota, when Jacob pronounced his final blessings over each tribe in Genesis 49, his blessings over the tribe of Dan were meant for Samson, who not only governed his people, but shielded Israel just as God shielded the whole world. In Josephus' first century rewriting of these texts, he magnifies Samson's characteristics to describe the child as one who would save Israel and as a prophet with a prudent or self-controlled lifestyle. The New Testament letter to the Hebrews, written around the same time, describes Samson as a great man of faith alongside David, Samuel, and the prophets. Today, Judges 13 is the only portion of the Samson narrative to appear in the Jewish or Catholic lectionary cycles. In the former, it's the Haftarah for the Torah portion of Naso, which is Numbers 4 through 7. And on this slide, you can see two images from his birth narrative, which proliferate, especially stained glass images, which are all over the place. (coughs) Chapter 13 is a powerful introduction. And like all introductions, it becomes the primary lens and the bias through which we read the material that follows. Yet this story may not have been about Samson at all, originally, for Samson's name appears only in the final editorialized verses. The story has intertextual links with Gideon narrative in Judges 6, with the birth story of Samuel in 1 Samuel 1, which may itself have originally been Saul's birth narrative, but that's another story. Some view this birth story as quite late, created purposefully as Samson's introduction to make him seem more savior-like as his stories were molded into the shape of a judge's scroll. But I would suggest that it may have had a prehistory before it was later repurposed to serve as Samson's introduction. Accepting a few statements in the opening and closing verses of this chapter, it need not be about Samson at all. After Judges 13, the landscape of the Samson stories shifts dramatically. Samson's parents disappear, We find ourselves in a series of vignettes about a certain Samson, the strong man, who was reactive, impulsive, amorous, oblivious to being set apart for God, isolated from any family or broader social unit. What's key to these stories is that they all take place in a liminal southwest space, the Shefela or lowlands, between the central highlands and the coastal plain, and specifically around Timnah and the Sorek Valley. 
This is an area that was marginal to the core geography of Judah, arguably throughout much of the Iron Age and certainly in the Second Temple period. According to the complex archaeological portrait of the Iron Age Shephelah, each site in the region had a slightly different social and political history, and political affiliations vacillated from site to site, especially prior to Sennacherib's campaign, which was in 701 BCE. Aaron Mayer, Louise Hitchcock, and other archaeologists working in the region define the Iron Age Shephelah as an entanglement of identities, meaning there's no way to define people in relation to our known categories, which generally draw from the Bible, like Israelite, Judahite, or Philistine. The Samson stories are the only biblical tales in which this region comes to life socially. It's geography embodied through individual characters and social groups. In these tales, Samson ranges up and down between the central highlands and the coastlands, desiring a series of women, most prominently a woman around Timnah, in chapters 14 to 15, then a woman from Gaza, and finally Delilah in the Sorek Valley. These women lie at the center of the Samson tales like geographical objects and abused figures, while men circle around them and have violent encounters through them. These men include the stereotypical Philistines, the enemy other from the coastlands, the Timnites, somewhere betwixt and between, the East Yehuda, or men of Judah from the highlands, who enter the story in Judges 15 as somehow other to Samson, and then, of course, the lone ranging Samson, who is locatable generally in relation to the women around him, who themselves are marginal figures. Gradations of otherness, of social and geographic liminality, define these strange stories. Neither monarchy, nor empire, nor temple is in view, at least explicitly, and Judah's role in the scene is brief. Some of these stories could be quite old. The oldest one is likely the first that we come to in this series of vignettes, the encounter between Samson and a lion. Samson tears a lion apart with his bare hands, then returns to the carcass a year later to find a swarm of bees and honey in the animal's remains, while, which he scoops out and eats. Even though this vignette appears directly after his birth story, it's dissonant with that story because it seems unaware of Nazarite vows, including the prohibition of eating unclean food, in Judges 13, or drawing near a, corp a corpse or a nephesh met, according to number six. Instead, it draws from an old and ubiquitous motif of heroes who fight and tame wild animals, evidence for which dates back at least to the middle of the third millennium on pre-Sargonic cylinder seals and on Sumerian seals. So for example, this uh, modern impression on the left from a Sumerian cylinder seal depicts human animal and composite figures engaged in combat. So there are a bunch of lions on the far left. You can see, if you look closely, like a naked one-eyed figure towards the right. And then in the image on the right, you can see a hero, which we think is Gilgamesh, holding a lion in his left hand and a snake in his right hand. The story of a mythological figure tearing apart a lion also echoes into the Greek Heracles, whose origins appear as early as the 8th century BCE in pictorial representations from southeast ancient Greece. And some would say that the Heracles and Samson traditions draw from a similar cultural well. Like Heracles, one could argue that Samson is a mythological creature, part god, part human. He tears apart a lion only after the spirit of Adonai rushes upon him in verse 6. And we hear these words, words ruah Adonai, and the spirit of, Yah, of Adonai rushed upon him three separate times throughout Judges 14 to 15. Each time, it connects his rage to divine inspiration. In a 4th century CE Roman catacomb, we find this mural alongside several other images, including one of Heracles and one of Daniel in the lion's den. And if we fast forward in time, an abundance of images of unidentified heroes subduing lions appear in the Middle Ages, including this image on the right in a church nave from the 11th century, which could be Samson or Heracles, or who knows, maybe Gilgamesh. The tale of the hero and the lion has a rich history and an independent life force in varied cultural and religious contexts and was also preserved in the tale of Samson. Following the lion, we come to Timnah and an unnamed woman. I'd like to linger on these stories for a moment because they're often considered to be the glue that holds the Samson cycle together. But unlike Samson and the lion, these tales have a varied and troubled interpretive history. 
The Timna material includes a wedding or betrothal scene between Samson and this anonymous or unnamed woman, which culminates in Samson's murder of 30 men, followed by a series of vignettes of destruction and slaughter in Judges 15, beginning with the woman's. She arguably lies at the center of these tales, and her story is a tragedy, a horror story even, though she has become lost in the shadows of history. A unique visual representation of the woman comes from Rembrandt, as you see here, an eerie image drawn from the feasting scene. The woman is at the center, unmoving and unreadable amid movement, a light shining on her as she stares fixedly back at us. In Judges 14, the feast derails through a riddle gone bad, in which Samson wagers an unfair bet that his male guests can't decipher a riddle that is indeed indecipherable without knowing Samson's history with the lion. The riddle reads, Out of the eater came something to eat, out of the strong came something sweet. The men confront the woman, threatening to burn her and her family alive unless she gives them the answer. She harasses Samson until he tells her. She tells the men, they correctly decipher the riddle, and Samson explodes in anger, again characterized as the spirit of Adonai rushing upon him. He flees down to the coast, slaughters 30 men, and Ashkelon then defiles their bodies. Meanwhile, the unnamed woman's tale ends in annihilation. Though she evades fire in Judges 14, it catches up to her in the next chapter. In this next vignette, Samson returns to the woman at her father's house, but her father has given her away to another man. Samson again explodes in anger, sets fire to foxes' tails, and releases the foxes to destroy Philistine fields. He then flees as the Philistines arrive, and when they realize what has happened, they burn the woman and her father alive, treating the woman as if she still belonged to Samson. Timna then disappears from the Samson narratives, its geography first brought to life and embodied by the woman, and just as soon destroyed or literally burned out with her, the woman, along with the surrounding fields. In the interpretive history of Judges 14 to 15, the unnamed woman is generally erased, but the surrounding scenes of destruction are embraced. So for example, note the scene of Samson's field torching among the floor mosaics at the late Roman synagogue at Hukok in Israel's Lower Galilee, dating between the 4th to 6th century CE. This poorly preserved image depicts the midsection of a man who is lighting foxtails. You can see him on the upper, on this right side, like on the upper left corner. And as you can see up on the close-up, on the left, he wears Roman garb, including what looks like an oval ornament around his knees, which is or called an orbiculum, which is a Roman warrior's outfit. Besides the lighted foxtails, we can tell that it's Samson because he also appears in another mosaic in a Roman synagogue just a few miles away at Kirbet Wadi Hammam wearing the same garb, and that one's on the right here. This image depicts a later scene, the one on the right, from Judges 15, following the burning of Timnah and the woman. After the obliteration of this space, the scene shifts and the men of Judah, or the Ish Yehuda, enter the Samson narrative for the first and only time. Their goal is to find Samson, capture him, bring him back to the Philistines. They find him in a cave and they ask, You knew that the Philistines rule, rule over us. Mazot asitalanu, what is this you have done to us? And he replies, As they did to me, so I did to them. Ka'ashasu li kanasiti lechem. Samson then allows the men to bind him and take him to the Philistines after, after they first promise not to harm him. And when they reach the Philistines, the spirit of Adonai rushes upon Samson, once again melting the ropes from his arms. He picks up, up the jawbone of an ass, a lehi chamor, and he massacres a thousand men. The massacre scene is what we see in this mosaic from Wadi Hammam on the right side. Where these stories of destruction and annihilation come from, and why they were preserved is a mystery. Perhaps some of the stories in Judges 14 to 15 derive from a post-701 BCE landscape after the Assyrian destruction and political reorganization of the Shephelah region when Judah lost its handle on the area surrounding Timnah. If so, then these vignettes are a counter-narrative, maybe, that present an alternative historical reality in which the Philistines stand in for the Assyrians Samson stands in for Judah, who demonstrates power over the Philistines by then burning out their fields and murdering their men. Or maybe the story derives from an older legend 
that is only later repurposed according to Judahite scribal aims. I would argue that this latter option seems more likely considering that Judah enters the narrative space only briefly and right after Timnah's torturing and what many would consider to be a later kind of augment to the tale. Moreover, in the Masoretic text, the kind of Hebrew recension that we have, the men of Judah are clearly separate from Samson, somehow like but not like him, blamed for his actions but apart from him, as suspicious of him as he is of them. This separation collapses a bit in the Old Greek, in which Samson's response to the Judahites is not, as they, the Philistines, did to me, so I did to them, but instead, as they did to us, so I did to them which implies a connection to the men of Judah. Josephus then makes this connection clearer, adding that Samson then places himself into the power of his tribe or his countrymen, ton fuleton, by allowing them to bind him and take him to the Philistines. I personally find it striking that we encounter interpretive silence around the unnamed woman, but not around Samson's acts of rage that happen around her. Some rabbinic sources regard Samson as a hero, even a messiah figure, through his ongoing slaughter of the Philistines. Jody Magnus, the lead excavator of the Hukok synagogue, argues that Jews in this region and time reveled in Samson's tales of destruction because they too were awaiting the one who would save them from their subjugators. According to biblical tradition, Samson came from the tribe of Dan, which eventually moved from the southwest to the far north, close to Asher and Naphtali, the region of the Hukok and Kir Kirbet Wadi Hammam synagogues. So perhaps this explains why Jews in this region had a particular affinity for Samson. But it's not just Jewish interpreters who had this affinity. As an example of a much later context during the Renaissance period, the scene that scene with the fox's tails and the Philistine uh, vineyards was heavily allegorized in Christianity as an instance of Samson acting as God's agent to rid the world of wickedness in the Church of Heretics, which Milton plays with in his tragedy, Samson Agonistes. Samson prefigured Christ, who would eventually triumph over darkness. What is strange about this Christian interpretation, though, is that that fox's scene is the one instance in which Samson's destruction is not couched in the language of the spirit of Adonai rushing upon him. Unlike the murder of 30 men in Judges 14, a massacre of 1,000 men with the jawbone in Judges 15, or even his final act of vengeance when he murders thousands in his death scene, there's no textual legitimacy or claim to divine commissioning in the obliteration of Timnus fields. One other Samson scene appears in the Hukok synagogue, which draws from a short interlude in the beginning of Judges 16 after the Timna tales. In the scene, Samson descends to Gaza, sees another unnamed woman, an Isha Zona, a prostitute, and sleeps with her. The, the people of Gaza plot to ambush him, but he slips out of the town unseen. As he leaves, he rips the town gate and, town and gate posts out of the ground and carries them along with him. One might not expect such a brief encounter, it's two verses long, to carry weight in the history of interpretation, and yet we find another well a well-preserved image in this case, of this very scene at Hukok, another instance in which Samson's rage and destructive impulses are highlighted in later religious contexts. To return to the unnamed woman from Timnah, one could argue that she is not in fact erased from the text, but that instead she lives on and enters the consciousness of the final female character in the Samson cycle, Delilah. Interpreters have not been so silent about Delilah, and while a certain discomfort may underline the silence around the Timnite woman, we find not discomfort, but, but an objectifying of and reveling in the Delilah story as demonstrated by these two examples in early modern and contemporary art. On the left is Peter Paul Rubin's classic Delilah, which depicts Delilah with her breasts uncovered. And on the right is a far more recent scene from Avi Katz's latest 20th century alien porn series, which if you haven't seen it, you should. It's very trippy. Um, but in that image, Delilah is on her knees. That's pretty sexually provocative, as you can see, while the Philistines wait like aliens at the door. And if we go farther back in time, as early as the first century CE, Josephus labeled Delilah a Philistine prostitute, even though the Samson stories never call her Philistine or a prostitute. According to early rabbinic sources, she tricked Samson to divulge his secrets by slipping out from under him in the heat of intercourse, driving him mad with desire. 
In Judges 16, Delilah is the one woman in the Samson narrative who receives a name. Like Samson, she has no people or place where she belongs. Her name functions as Samson's opposite. She sounds like the knight, Lila, facing Sam Samson, Shemesh, the sun. Delilah and the unnamed woman share a common motif of a woman who nags a man until he divulges secrets. In the case of Delilah, that his hair is the source of his strength. Their stories even share the same verb forms as both coax, patach, Samson, and neg, suk him. It's hard to know the relationship between Delilah and the unnamed woman, though their stories likely evolve together at some point. The Delilah story may be growing out of the tale of the unnamed woman. The Delilah tale is more exaggerated. It's easier to poke fun at. She's not murdered, but merely disappears, which makes her tale less discomforting. In her story, Samson seems more innocent, less vengeful than in Judges 14 to 15. He falls in love with her, or so the narrator says in verse 4. Delilah was not threatened with death, but instead promised money by the Philistines for her betrayal. So she nags Samson until she nags Samson and he tells her the story or the truth about where his strength lies. She then lulls him to sleep on or between her knees and calls in a man who shaves his head, which allows the Philistines to capture Samson, gouge out his eyes, take him down to Gaza, and that's where we come to the final Samson scene. And in this culminating scene, he's enslaved and made to dance suggestively before the Philistines. It's humiliating to imagine. He calls out to Adonai to remember him and give him strength one last time for revenge, he manages to pull down an entire building around him, destroying himself and thousands of people. This conclusion is either a tragic and shameful downfall, his punishment for his weakness for foreign women, maybe foreign women, as some rabbinic sources have stipulated, or perhaps it is his culminating salvific act of vengeance and self-sacrifice, if you ask other sources. It reads as a relatively late story, and one could argue that a vision of Judah's political subjugation under foreign rule does indeed underlie this dramatic encounter between Samson, the Philistine lords, and the large mass of Philistine people as they come together to worship their god, Dagon, in the temple and make fun of Samson. And two striking examples uh, of, this, of the latter reading of Samson as a kind of a hero come from more modern periods. So once again during the Renaissance, as Milton communicates with in Samson Agonistes, and the other in African American history in the US, for whom Samson's final self-sacrificial act, as well as his ongoing acts or, of rage and violence, have made him an icon for anyone who would challenge racial oppression. The aesthetics of biblical biography including Samson, rest uncomfortably with modern sensibilities, where we seek cohesion, character development, explanations of inner experience. We encounter contradiction, fragmentation, and silence. Biblical characters often lack stable essences, and individuality is not an end in itself, but a site of memory for ongoing scribal discourse. Samson is no different. Reading his stories is like peering at a mosaic, each piece of the story, each vignette, provides us with a glimpse of a figure, a variation on a theme in which scribal artists arrange the tiles to produce a certain picture. He is one set aside from God in the womb. He's violent and vengeful, or a warrior and a hero of faith. He has a weakness for women and loves them or abuses them. He is the oppressor or the oppressed, a mythological demigod, a self-sacrificial man, a source of humiliation. Over time, different artists arrange the tiles to produce different pictures, which we see in the history of interpretation that I've only barely uncovered today. Which picture is most pleasing depends on the criteria the viewer applies to the result. And these criteria change in long transmission and reception processes. While we may find Samson compelling as a changeable character, what I find equally compelling is how his characteristics embody Israelite and Judahite geography and history. In my view, Samson likely had a prehistory embodying a heroic Israelite figure, his tales linking to legends of heroes like Gilgamesh and Heracles, a mythological figure who tamed wild beasts and whose destructive impulses were somehow appealing to ancient audiences. We don't know when his stories were first written down or how they developed, 
We have no evidence for scribal practices in ancient Israel preceding the Hellenistic period, so our theories about earlier periods are inevitably conjectural, conjectural, but that shouldn't prohibit us from imagining the possibilities. I would suggest that at some point, Samson's stories were drawn together with other savior figures in Judges 3 to 12, is another example of a warrior in the earlier tribal land, early tribal landscape of central Israel. He helped to expand Israel's tribal arena through his southwest connection. He fought against the so-called Philistines, and he was loosely connected to Timnah. Whatever his narrative history, we know that eventually he becomes the linchpin in a judge's scroll between the savior tales in Judges 3 to 12 and the accretions or additions in, in chapters 17 through 21. Slowly, over time, he transforms from a liminal Shephelah figure into an Israelite and then a Judahite, a process of history writing that we can witness partially by caring, comparing the Hebrew, the old Greek translations, Josephus, and ongoing interpretations. So I'll conclude with just a brief word on history. The term itself is marked by tension. Though its preoccupation is the past, its reality is present. We can never capture the truth of what was once really real. Walter Benjamin once said that the past is that which flits by us, arising in moments of present relevance and often danger, brought back to life when it is narrativized in relation to present context. Some things fall into the shadows of the past as if they never existed, but other things are and can be reborn if we just have an indelible ink or social memory of its past narrations, like the story of the unnamed woman from Timnah. Biblical texts, their contradictions, fragmentations, and adjunctions remind us that the production of history and social memory is ongoing narration. There is never a clear point where it congeals as something fixed and determined. An aspect of it can always be picked up, rewritten, reshaped. Biblical texts are unique from other forms of history writing because they preserve within them a steady stream of discourse. The rule of modern narration doesn't seem to apply to biblical texts, and scribes seem more interested in preserving the cacophony of views than in presenting a unified, consistent view of the past. It is this cacophony that makes Jewish history and tradition remarkable. As Gershom Sholem once observed, tradition is a vibrant and living force presenting not a unified or consistent view, but one that is diverse, multifold, and full of contradictions. The purpose of tradition, he said, was to hold these contradictions with astounding seriousness and intrepidity, as if to say that one can never know whether a view at one time rejected may not one day become the cornerstone of an entirely new edifice. In other words, tradition and history have changing modes of existence that are possible precisely because of the careful preservation of contradictory views within ongoing contexts of production and reception. In recognizing and leaning into the complexity of textual formation and tradition in biblical texts, including the Samson stories, perhaps we come closer to understanding the intentions of our scribes as they shaped Jewish history. I believe that these ancient texts also have something crucial to teach us today in terms of our own ongoing social and political discourse about the recent past, about the possibilities and the dangers about how we remember, remake, and forget our own living history. Thank you. We have time for a few questions. I'll let you feel the... Thanks so much. I really enjoyed your talk a lot. I was kind of curious. I really like the framework of Samson around different women, like as being the, the situations that the stories kind of come out of. And I was wondering, um, like, how you think that fits into the treatment of women in the book of Judges as a whole? Yeah. Well, Judges is a really complicated text yeah. for how it treats women and in really different ways. And there are all kinds of like feminist commentaries. Um, gender sexuality studies on that because they're really highlighted in certain parts, like more than anywhere else in the Bible, Judges 4 to 5 in particular, right, um, with Deborah and Yael. Um, but then, of course, the very end 
has like the most violent stories that I generally don't even read in class. I mean, unless it's like I give students real warning because they're really horrible, horrible stories. Go read Judges 19 and you'll see what I mean. Um, so yeah, this is just you know another example of, of those. Um, some people would try to kind of make it coherent and explain that there's something about this kind of decentralized landscape you know, before order, so-called order, that makes things kind of more malleable and susceptible to all of these things. I guess because I view texts as so fragmented, I have a hard time finding a consi one consistent theme there personally. And I think the, at least the women in the Samson narrative, they kind of, for me at least, become the embodiments of this kind of liminal Shafela geography, and that's a, a big component of who they are. Thanks. Yeah. Uh, so just thinking out loud here, just going off of that question, uh, it reminds me a lot of the way that Helen is, is portrayed in, in the Iliad, in the Trojan narratives, where she's at both she's both blamed and a victim at the same time. Interesting. It's kind of, the, the text never really lets, lets you figure out yeah. uh, what the text thinks of Helen. It really leaves you up, it up to, to the... Uh, to the reader or the audience. And yeah. I wonder if something similar is going on with the women in, in these judges' stories. Or do you think they're more, more, more blamed? No, I actually don't think that there's a lot of narrative judgment going on in the stories themselves about the women. I think, again, they kind of function as this kind of liminal space. It's what we've done with them since then that has so overlaid them with the judgment that we can't get, you know, you can't get it gone now. Like, <laughs> that's my, that's my view. But that's really interesting about Helen. I'd never have to go look at that. Yeah. I thought it was interesting um, when you talked about the chronology of um, when the narratives of Samson first came along. And I'm, I'm curious because you, you talked about how it would have been uh, against Nazarene, like, um, ethics for him to go ahead a year later to eat the honey and yeah. bees and all that. And I'm curious, um, was there, w within like the compiling of these stories, do you think that the Jewish people themselves who were compiling these saw those contradictions and like didn't, like do you think they were okay with them? <laughs> like the fact that they were so like, hey, he wouldn't have done that, but he's doing that. Yeah, it's a great question, and yes, I mean, I think absolutely, otherwise they wouldn't be preserved, you know. Um, people have worked really hard to make them seem consistent, you know, so like there are all kinds of articles and studies about how, like, no, he's not actually breaking the Nazarite rules, or, or numbers is a lot later, and they just weren't around then, and all, you know, et cetera, but like, they are all left in there, and not just left in there, but like back-to-back -back stories, right, not even separated. <laughs> a little bit. Um, so yeah, I think they were totally comfortable. And that's why it upsets modern sensibilities, because like, we want cohesion, right? We want the hero's journey. We want, we want something. Um, and they are just not going to give that to us. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So I know you've also done some work with the, with the Book of Ruth. Yeah, right? yeah. So I'm wondering if you've thought of the story of Samson in conjunction with Boaz who's also a strong man who lives during the period of the judges um, and who also marries a foreign woman. Um, have you thought, do you have any thoughts on both of them contrasted or related? Um, do you also see the Book of Ruth as, or Boaz as kind of this embodiment uh, of kind of Israelite, Judah, Judaite Judah. Hi. Um, yeah. History. So just w wondering if you have yeah. any thoughts on any of this. Yeah, that's a great question. I mean, the short answer is no, because I think Boaz is elevated, like in no uncertain terms, as mm -hmm. this kind of kind of perfect figure, right? He does what he's supposed to do. Um, he like completely com he complies with everything. There's nothing negative about him unless you dig deep, right, like in the commentary that I wrote, like there's a, there's a lot of space, so we, we overanalyzed to the extreme Boaz, but I would say he's pretty simple as a character. And the Book of Ruth is also a pretty simple book. Um, it's idyllic. I mean, there's all kinds of danger, but 
it also reads as a perfect kind of fantasy story you could read to kids at night. You know, it's like Sesame Street. Like you don't get the danger unless you, until you grow up, and then you get like the all of the stuff that kids don't get. You know, um, so I, I I would see them as functioning in really different ways. Yeah, that's a good question. Yeah. Two questions. First of all, is there any significance to the name Sam's son? Because it's son of Sam, you know, like, is there a Sam, you know, is it any Sam or <laughs> as far as that? The other one is, there was a weird book made in 1920 called Judge and Pool, okay. which later on was the basis to 1949 Cecil B. DeMille novel uh, by a guy named Jablonski or something. And I just wondered if you had any comment on that. I've never heard of it. Judge and Fool? Yeah, it was actually. Um, to look it up. Yeah, I've never heard of that. Um, as for Samson, I mean, his name Shimshon in Hebrew doesn't have any relation to like what we would think of as like son of. Um, but that's where you know potentially he's kind of linked to Shemesh, which is son. Um, and some people would connect him to a certain site in the Shephelah, which is Beit Shemesh. Uh, because of his name as well. Thank yeah, thanks for the reference. Good morning. Other questions? Thank you very much.